Welcome to Orthodoxy Questions Answered on location today. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Back in the back in the uh, in the home cell, right? <laughs> more or less. More or less. Well, why are we doing something so ridiculous today? Well, you know, it had to. It, it's uh, nowadays. It comes for everyone. And so I am one of the latest victims, uh, or was one of the latest victims of COVID, and so I'm um, I'm um, broadcasting my last day here in quarantine uh, from uh, from the comfort of our quarantine home. So so that's why I'm here. But uh, everything looks good. Uh, I'm all recovered, no more sore throat, and uh, and I'm going to blame it all on vaccine that it worked. <laughs> Well, you know, at least at least you're back on your feet and you sound great. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And most importantly, I didn't catch it. <laughs> I tested negative. And that's right. I didn't give that's right. I didn't give it to uh didn't give it to you. If, if with uh, all the close contact we've had, I figured you would have been one of the first, but uh you uh I keep having close calls. Uh I nearly get stuck in a room with somebody that gets COVID. I nearly get you know, I, I, I just I keep getting in situations where I'm so close to getting in contact with somebody who is legitimately sick at that moment and I somehow escape it. So um, thank God for that. And I did for a long time, too. I, I you know, because everybody was uh, I was everybody, but a lot of people were calling me. Oh, I've been exposed and I would test and nothing happened. So sooner or later, buddy, it's going to get you. Well, it did get me a long, uh, like right before it, it, the lockdowns, I got sick and then I got tested. And it turns out that I had caught it, but I didn't even, I, I didn't even realize it. Even oh, this wow. was even okay. before we started doing the live streams for the church. So, oh, geez. Okay. yeah, okay. yeah. Just two days where I just, just felt like I had intense allergies. That was it. And then it turns out, oh, that, that was COVID. Oh, oh, good to get that over with right off, right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. So. Hey, so um, does anybody has anybody um, tuned in from our to our to our home show? Yes, we have quite a few uh, questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them tonight. We're only going for an hour or so, but let's just jump right into it. Our first one is from I love this name from Wayfaring Stranger. Uh, wow. Hello from London, United Kingdom, Great Britain, Father. Um, are mentally no, ill. We'll, are we'll mentally... be uh, what hmm? we're counting down. We're gonna two months, two months, and we're gonna be in the northern part of the UK. Oh, that's gonna Looking be exciting. Forward to that once again. You're gonna have to do some travel videos. Oh, t trust me, the Tartan priest will be on the road in Scotland. <laughs> Perfect. The question is: Are mentally ill people just as accountable for their sins as much as, uh, to put in in their words, regular people? If so, why? when they obviously struggle more with their genetics, minds, etc. Well, certainly over time, the church, through the advances that have been made in medical science, have learned a lot more about mental illness and about, you know, the responsibilities associated with that. So on one hand, we've learned how to, we've learned how to better diagnose true mental illness as opposed to those that are just claiming mental illness, okay? Um, so the answer, short answer to the question is that if somebody is, um, let's say, uh, mentally incompetent to make a rational decision, then the church would exclude them um they wouldn't they wouldn't call they wouldn't say they don't sin they wouldn't say that because certainly they are going to they are going to know some degree of right and wrong but they're not going to understand let's say possibly the nuances of right or wrong the way that let's say somebody who is not affected by that illness uh might might be this is why in all, not the vast majority, but all the cases that have been presented to me in the case of suicide, the bishop has always ruled that we can offer them an Orthodox funeral because uh, either the depression or the mental state affected their ability to make a rational decision. So, so the answer to the question is that, you know, again, it really, it really depends if we can show that they understood the 
the consequences and the impact of what it is that they did, then certainly we can hold them accountable to some degree of that particular sin. But once it becomes nuanced, then there's uh, economia and mercy on the part of the church. Um, I had always heard, and correct me if, I, if, if this is the wrong assertion, but that when it came time for, for judgment, uh, that God would give them the same graces as they would give a child. Um, oh, I mean, okay, okay. I mean, uh, um, I, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily have, have anything, anything against, uh, against that, but uh, I don't want to make, I don't want to necessarily make the connection that, um, you know, that every mental, every person who suffers from a mental illness has the rationality of a child. I don't want to, I don't want to make that. I guess it depends on the severity of the mental condition. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. We have a few submitted questions, but because we're uh, a little bit on the rush for time, I'm only going to answer one. We'll save them for next week uh, or if we have time later. Uh, David Neck asks, how do we clean our icons at home? Oh, um, easy, easy enough. I mean, you can clean you, you can clean your icons with uh, with any normal detergent or soap that uh, that you would use, uh, you know, if you're cleaning, uh, cleaning windows or, or something like that. Um, so there's no uh, and again, th- there's uh, there's no special. Um, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, there's no special uh, rinsing procedure a washing procedure or disposal procedure of the water or anything like that. Again, because all you're doing is taking care of the icon, just as in the church, when we clean, uh, let's say the mosaics or we clean iconography, we don't have to, those cleaning rags aren't, aren't blessed. Um, but what we're doing is we're maintaining um, and we're caring for something that is blessed. So any so we can just use any kind of normal cleaning material that we have, and certainly we don't want to use anything that is going to destroy the integrity of the icon. Uh, yes, I, I would add. I would throw oh. in depending on how the icon is painted, uh, you would probably should double check to see if uh, any kind of cleaning might destroy the the painting. Uh, right, and in fact, that's what uh, Terry said is a mild detergent. <laughs> <laughs> Although. Uh, in concordance with that documentary, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, this is the one time I've actually heard you recommend Windex. There, that's well, that's right because you know a lot of the icons that you buy nowadays are lacquered. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the Windex is perfectly fine to use on those lacquered uh, icons. Absolutely. Uh, Trench has a, a question. Um, what if you pray to a better Christian and you only sin worse? Then what? God doesn't want us to be better, but worse. Um, All right, I got it. Um, I, I am uh, a little confused by that question. Uh, there is a note. I want to double check to see if it's connected to that question. I'll just read the note anyway, because it seems interesting. The ancient Greek gods were more like angels, which angels mean messengers, which there was the message by Apollo from the Oracle of Delphi that Christ would come in, a lot of history is ignored. Okay, it doesn't seem like that's a connection to this, but that is true that um, there we tend to ignore a lot of history in general, um, maybe sometimes for convenience. I don't mean orthodoxy uh, uh, specifically. I mean, generally speaking, humanity. Um, right. Let's take a look at that first question one more time. What if you pray... Okay, what if you pray to be a better Christian... Um, but even though you do so, you only continue to sin, maybe even worse than what, uh, God doesn't want us to be better, but worse. That last part, I don't understand, but let's focus on the first part. What if you pray to be a better Christian, but it turns out that, uh, you succumb to worse sins. What do you do in that case? Well, all of the prayers of the church encourage us to be uh, to to be better Christians, to be more Christ-like. I mean, we're we're not seeking to be better Christians; we're seeking to be more Christ-like. Okay, I mean, I'm just making a, a technic a technicality here. Okay, um, but remember, Saint Paul himself says, "I do the things I shouldn't, and I don't do the things I should." We've got Saint Paul equal to the apostles who is saying that he also suffers from this. 
you know, and that he prays to be able to be, quote unquote, a better Christian, and that even he is not capable. This was the major defense against the sin of Pelagianism. All right. So Pelagius, Pelagius was, um, uh, was a uh, priest and heretic of the, um, uh, of the early church. And he said that God, God, that man can work out his own salvation, that he is capable of overcoming sin. And he was declared a heretic. Um, in fact, um, was it, uh, was it Ambrose, Ambrose that wrote, uh, uh, uh contra Pelagius against the Pelagians arguing that no, it is impossible for, because sin is so universal, it is impossible to be saved or to save yourself without the intervention and the mediation of Jesus Christ. So even though our prayer is to be more Christ-like, because we are tainted by sin universally, then unfortunately we will continue to fall into sin. So what we pray for is that we will continue to always strive and never give up on being Christ-like. Real quick, I want to make a shout out to Auden. Uh, even though they attracted their messages, they had posted uh, some of the uh, the early one by Wayfaring Stranger, just in case it get it, it got lost. Sometimes when you put in uh, a message before the stream starts. YouTube sporadically deletes them. So I just want to thank Auden for, for doing that. Um, let's see. Um, Migs asks, why is it important for us to be confessed before taking communion? The Bible teaches that the blood of Christ in communion should be taken for the remission of sins. But why is it important for us to be confessed before taking communion? Hmm. Okay. So let me, so um, remember now, we don't want to make, we don't want to make confession tied to Holy Communion only as a means of obligation, meaning that the obligation to receive Holy Communion is confession. We want, we want to be very careful not to make that immediate connection. And I say that because the sacrament of confession has a healing that is uh, just like Holy Communion has healing. So what Holy Confession does for us is it al allows us to give voice to our sin so that the priest can then offer counseling and guidance to help us to be a better Christian to be more Christ-like, and to help identify what is our sins that may or may not be visible to us. So I want to start with, I want to start with that. Confession should not just be tied to receipt of Holy Communion where it becomes an obligation. So that's reason number one, okay? Now, we do receive Holy Communion for the forgiveness or for the remission of sins. And I understand that if you have gone to confession, okay, you have confessed those sins, or you, sorry, you have received absolution for, I'm assuming, for those sins that you have confessed. But that doesn't mean that you don't continue to sin, because, because some people don't immediately have, you know, don't immediately have, um, uh, Holy Communion right after confession. So it may be a couple of days, it may be a couple of weeks, it could be a, a month, a couple of months. So there is still sin being committed on the part of the person, and so Holy Communion is for the remission of those sins that that have transpired since or post the, uh, the confession that we have attended and the absolution that we've received. And on top of that, a lot of people don't necessarily remember all the sins they commit uh, and bring them up yeah, yeah. for confession. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, Trench has a question in regards to the holy fire. Uh, but before we get to that question, um, really quickly, for the people who are not aware of what the holy fire is, um, if you can speak on that real fast. So, uh, so in Jerusalem... 
at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there was a, the whole the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is built over the entire area of the final days of Jesus Christ. Not the entire area, but but a, a lot most of the area. Part of that area is the tomb where he was laid and the place where he was crucified. All right. The tomb where he was buried in the early times became a place of worship, obviously, and liturgies were conducted historically in that tomb. Okay. So to that, to this day, there are liturgies that are still can be conducted in there. But once a year at Easter, then uh, the patriarch will, and I believe the patriarch of Jerusalem, will enter in, and after a series of prayers and chanting, he will go in there with unlit candles, Paschal candles, and what will happen is there will be a self-ignition of his Paschal candles inside that tomb, and then he will emerge with those lit candles, and from that, then all of the attendants, all of the, the people attending will also then light their candles. There's been all kinds of investigations um, to uh, find out if he went in with a book of matches or is there some kind of electrical current happening in there and nobody can discover this. And this has happened continuously every single year. All right. So the question is, the holy fire shows up on old calendar day and Greek Orthodox only. Not on the new calendar, Catholic or other Orthodox, as, try, uh, as tried, um, which the broken columns is also an indication, but never mentioned as well. Isn't that an indication that the day and who can perform that miracle? So the a question is in regards to the old versus new calendar and the holy fire. I guess, you know what, I guess I... I... I ha I am not aware of them attempting to light it. Um, I have heard, and again, I'm just I'm just hearsay now, that uh, Catholic uh, Catholic uh, cardinals and 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 bishops have tried to uh, have, have tried to obtain the holy fire, and they have been unable. Okay. And I can't speak to the reason of why that is, or even if that is if that is true. Um, what I don't want to do is 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 create holy fire as witchcraft, meaning that that God can only act on a certain day. So if we believe that the Holy Spirit flows where it will, as Jesus Christ has told us, then I think that it's more about the event than it is about a specific formula that must be followed. All right. So to make us to make us a, a correlation between a day and an event happening, I think uh, reaches extends a little bit too far, because again it borders on witchcraft. We have a second question from Migs. Um, what is separating the Oriental Orthodox Church and the Eastern Church? Oh. Huh. Oh, that's always a that's always a good question and 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 uh deserves deserves um uh, deserves study. Um this is something that I am not as as well versed on as I should be uh and this is certainly something that uh that deserves a uh that deserves a 101. Um so uh I'm going to I'm I'm going to have to pass on this particular question and and offer up, I think, next week then, because uh, I know that this question has been asked several times, and I think very, very early on, um, I had some information, I made an answer, but it it um, it determines a, a, a better answer than I'm able to or prepared to give right now. So All my right. apologies for that. So tune in next week when Father will get back to that question. So um, Oriental Orthodox. I know that that question has come up several times. So my my fault on not being prepared for that. Well, I can answer at least one part of the question. Their names are different. Yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> uh, Auden has a question. Um, uh, actually, two questions. 
May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all. Firstly, how are you, Lot? Uh, I can say for myself, I'm I'm excellent, uh, Father. Uh, and uh, I am uh, I'm doing well myself. I am uh, I am like I like I said at the beginning of the show. I'm in the last day of our uh, of our quarantine from COVID, but uh, I feel pretty good. Um, I had a little bit of uh, sore throat and some tiredness, but uh, that seems to have uh, passed me by now. Perfect. And thank you for asking. Uh, the second question is, um, if tattoos of, are sinful, uh, I'm aware, the question says, I'm aware that this is a cliche question, but I've gotten mixed an answers. So what is the orthodox perspective on tattoos? Sinful? Um, cool? <laughs> I assume not that part, but go for it. Um, well, so, so the origin of this is, uh, is Old Testament. It says that the body shall not be marked, all right? doesn't use the word necessarily tattoos per se, uh, but it says the body shall not be marked, all right? And Christianity, the New Testament has picked up on this from the fact that do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So in that sense, this is where Orthodox theology comes from on many different subjects, whether it's... Uh, on any kind of abuses of the body, whether that's abortion, whether that's tattooing, whether that's um, gluttony, um, uh, bulimia, um, I'm trying to think of other things you can do to your body. Um, I, I don't know if you said piercings, because I, I may have missed it. Oh, pier yes, yeah, piercings. What? Uh, right. No, uh, like I said, not eating properly. Any, any, anything that can be viewed as detrimental to the body is frowned upon by orthodoxy. So we don't want to just pick on tattooing. Let's, let's enclose everything in here that could be detrimental. So gluttony certainly can be also in that, in that, um, that uh, um, collection, but specifically addressing now, you're going to hear some different opinions, different, depending upon the Orthodox Church that you talk to. All right. Here within the GOA, that the, the, the common answer that you're going to get is, why do you want the tattoo? All right. What are you trying to say? So many of us in the military, not me, um, have, have tattoos. And the reason that we get tattoos, just like they do in fraternities, is as a sign of brotherhood or sisterhood. So there's a community bonding that that tattoo ties people together. So in that sense, it doesn't have any detrimental value to it. There's no political statement being made. Um, there's no uh, offenses uh, uh, trying to be issued all it is is a sign of community and brotherhood or sisterhood. So in that sense, at least from the GOA's perspective, we don't, we don't have anything against that. We're not encouraging it, but we understand the reason. When it becomes something political or demonic, like I'm going to get a swastika tattooed on my, uh, on my forehead or I'm going to get the devil or uh, Satan rules, okay, those things obviously the church is going to frown upon because of the message that's being sent is clearly anti-Christian. All right. Uh, well, I have a question. Uh, we've gone that a couple times before, but we've never addressed the, this follow-up. If let's just say that you have tattoo, maybe you have an entire sleeve of tattoos. All right. And then you convert to Christianity, you convert to orthodoxy. What is your responsibility then? Do you have to remove the tattoos or can no, you just ask no, for forgiveness? Just, What's the step? No, I mean, and, and again, you know, the reason is, you know, we're going to ask why, you know, <clears throat> what was the reason for getting the tattoos? Okay. And more than likely, it's the answer is probably going to be, hey, I just love the art. I just love body painting. And I was really into that. And that's what I wanted to do. I wasn't trying to send a political message. I don't. Uh, I don't hate people. I don't. Uh, I don't hate Christians. I don't hate Jews or Muslims. Um, it's just something that I enjoy doing. Okay, you did it. There's nothing we could do about it. We're not going to ask you to remove the tattoos. Okay, 
and you're going to enter into the church. Okay. We can't help you with, you know, finding a job and things like that because you can't cover up your tattoos, but Hey, that's on you. If you have something that is uh, considered demonic from the orthodoxy perspective and it's visible, there's nothing you can do to hide it. If you go into the church, what steps would you take if you, if you could take a step? Well, um, well, that's, you know, that's a very, very good question. And that's obviously going to have to be on a case by case basis, because because what we're the what the church is going to have to work through is is um, the reasons that you did it. And are those reasons still valid? You know, I mean, I mean, uh, you don't n- nobody just jokingly puts Satan or, or pentagrams on their, um, you know, uh, in a visible area of their body, if they're not trying to make a statement, right? I mean, this is not just done for fun. So there's something behind that, and the church needs to investigate that and understand if they are truly repentant and if they truly want to join the body of Christ, or is this just a game that they're playing? Aaron asks, well, first Aaron says, Hristos Anesti. Halithos Anesti. Uh, their first question we know that Islam is one of the three Abrahamic faiths, and they share some similarities. But after reading the Quran, it's hard to accept they worship the same God, or do they? Well, as as Orthodox, we believe that that, uh, and of course, you'll find some extremists, you know, in this also. But generally speaking, as Orthodox, we see the Jews and we see the Muslims as people of the book, that they are. This, that we are all descended from the Abrahamic, as you mentioned, the Abrahamic, and actually everybody, right, from the Abrahamic uh, uh, tribes. So in that sense, we believe there is only one God and that they worship the same one God, but that the Jews and the Muslims do not understand the fullness of who God is in his Trinitarian manner. Uh, Brett Hagen uh, says, Christos uh, Anesti. Uh, and uh, doesn't have a question here, but he wants to point out that uh, their middle school mascot was the Tartan. All right. Very, very cool. And hey, Brett, uh, I believe that you told me that you did receive your Archon starter kit. So uh, um, I just want to confirm that, that everything is good. It's all working and uh, and um, you're uh, you're using it. Uh, and for those unaware, the reason why Tardins is um, is important here is uh, we also do a, sh- a travel show called The Tartan Priest. Our next episode's coming up very, very, very soon, uh, where we where Father goes on roller coasters. So we're, <laughs> we're looking forward. Now, to do this. they? Well, now, do they understand why we do Tartan Priest? Well, you're gonna have to tune in and find out. Oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> um. Greek 70s has a question, and I noticed that this is a resubmission of a question we didn't get to last week. Thank you, Greek 70s, for for being back. Um, The question is, did you see the film Man of God, The Life of St. Nectarios of Aegina? Yes, uh, of Aegina, right, of Aegina. Um, Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I really, really well done, just absolutely well done. I thought the... I thought the, uh, the the characters gave a depth uh, to Saint Nectarios. I have I have been to Aegina. Um, I've um, I've seen his uh, sarcophagus. I've I've um, I, the monastery was under construction, uh, but I saw I was inside the church. Um, I I saw his uh, keli, his uh, where he lived. So we went on the island, and we and we were able to travel around. Uh, I went to um, uh, to uh, Rosario, the the uh, the school that he worked at uh, in Athens. Uh, sorry, in Thessaloniki, and and all of those were great, but they're places. What this film did is it brought those places to life during his time, and I. I know the story of him being um, um, uh, declared a, uh, um, not a heretic, but what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, denounced uh, and then um, uh, banished uh, the problems that he had, um, that he fought to be uh, reestablished in the church. And so 
I heard about those struggles, but what the movie did was really bring those struggles to life so that I could see how difficult his life truly was. And, and then also got to see how dedicated the people were to St. Nectarios. So I thought that was a, a very, very beautiful thing. The only thing they, uh, I wish they would have spoken a little bit more about his, uh, his miracles um, uh, because he is the patron saint of, of cancer because many, many of his miracles was curing cancer. Um, so that was, and again, that's just, I'm just being technical now, but, but w very, very well acted. Maestro Gunda has a question. I come from a Hindu background, married to a formal Catholic. My husband is not so much interested in orthodoxy. How do I handle that? So it, formal or former? Uh, it says formal. Oh, so maybe, oh, okay. But she is, she's saying she's Orthodox now? Uh, I be, yeah, I believe so, yes. So maybe that's former the, Catholic, they, yeah. now now Orthodox. Well, no, no, they're married um, to, uh, the, I'll repeat the question. Um, I come from a Hindu background, married mm -hmm. to a formal Catholic. Uh, my husband is oh. not so much interested in orthodoxy. How do I handle that? Well, you know, again, that's a, maybe just the way to handle it is, you know, l let him be in his uh, in his Catholic faith. I mean, um, we as Orthodox, <laughs> at least uh, at least among the among the moderate Orthodox, we believe that the Catholics have the path to heaven, to the kingdom of heaven, and the access to God and the Holy Spirit just as much as the Orthodox do. Okay, maybe we'll argue about their fullness versus our fullness, all right, but they have a pathway to the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so maybe there's maybe there's nothing to do here. You know, if if he is confident in his Catholic faith and 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 uh, and he is true to his Catholic faith, then maybe that's enough. All right. We have or I have uh, through all of my parishes, I've had many people who one partner is formal Catholic, meaning that, and they, they, they absolutely love the Catholic faith and they have no desire to uh, convert. And the other partner is Orthodox and have no wish, no, no uh, desire to be uh, or to be Catholic. And they get along very, very well. And they have kids and those kids grow up normal. And it's great. If he is trying to be a stumbling block and saying, no, orthodoxy is not right. And you and so you now don't have the fullness of the faith and your access is barred to the kingdom of heaven. That's problematic. OK, then now we've got a problem is because he is he is impeding you. All right. So we recognize orthodoxy and we recognize Catholicism as both having equal access to God, the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. So what the Orthodox Church would be against is any kind of language that is derogatory or is trying to now pull you away from a faith that you are very dedicated to. But other than that, you know, if, if he's not interested in orthodoxy, then, you know, he's not. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the Orthodox uh, view Catholics as having the pathway to heaven. Um, does, the, or, does Orthodoxy view any other Christian denomination as not having the pathway to heaven? Not any other Christian denomination. Okay. So... So, you know, again, um, uh, the, so the only, it only includes the three, Protestantism, Catholicism, and Orthodoxy. All right. All right. Um, quick uh, shout out to Jack uh, Sage uh, Phoenix and Costa V. Um, Andrew92HT has a question. What's the Orthodox view on marijuana? I ask in the context in the in the context of not getting very intoxicated, but more in the sense of a small amount via edibles that just brings on a calming effect, like a glass of wine. So, um, you know, we do have the you know we do have Christ's words. You know, um, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's; render unto God what is God. Uh, uh, the Orthodox interpretation, of course, of that is going to be that everything is rendered unto God, 
We do not have separation of church and state. Equally so, we have uh, we have Christ paying the temple tax. Okay, he fished the coin uh, uh, out of the out of the mouth of the fish. So we do have him obeying the law. Okay, so in that sense, it's not a question so much of marijuana as it's a question of breaking the law. In many states now, there is um, there is a legalization of a recreational amount of use usage of marijuana including here in new york oh yeah i guess including here in new york so the orthodox church doesn't doesn't have doesn't have anything against that um that use of a legal substance but used in moderation okay so just as we would say, just as the church would be against the um, abusive use of alcohol, so we would also be against the abusive use of marijuana. So again, we the the I love the Orthodox Church because we're not hypocritical. We don't say, "Oh, we're against marijuana," but hey, drink all you want. No, we don't say that. What we say is anything that you use. Or, sorry, anything that you abuse, the church is against. If you abuse food, we're against it. If you abuse alcohol, we're against it. If you abuse drugs, we're against it. But in this case, now in New York, it is legal for a certain amount, and so the church doesn't have an issue with that. Uh, Trench has a clarification on the earlier question he had about uh, holy fire. And he just oh. want to point out that the that his mention of the burnt column is also an indication, which is why, uh, uh, of something that is ignored in regards to the fire. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what the burnt column is? I don't know what the burnt column is. <laughs> oh. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and I haven't, uh, I, I got to say, I, you know, I haven't, you know, I haven't, I haven't studied that. Um, I mean, I can look at it. I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure um, is is the burnt column going to lead me to not be? Is the is the burnt column going to lead me to become old calendar? I mean, I'm not really sure where I'm going to go with that. So if I learn that the burnt, if I learn about the burnt column, will will that sign convince me that I should be an old calendarist? Because frankly. I think the whole issue of new and old calendar is just ridiculous. It's it's just ridiculous. You know, it because we're steering away from what we should be focused on, which is Christ. And if we're going to argue about thirteen days, then we're not very Christ-like. I would like to uh, maybe in the future do a video about the Holy Fire. It's particularly interesting. If things go well, maybe Tartan Priest on location, huh? <laughs> Wow, that would be okay. Well, we do have what we're hoping for is that next year, twenty three, when we hope that COVID will really have have subsided, is we've been trying to plan a trip to Jerusalem uh, for the last year, or last two years, and we've been thwarted every turn. I've got a list of people who are ready to go, so we absolutely are going to have an opportunity to do that. Do priests? And we're hoping that's twenty three. Do priests actually have very much of a of a chance to actually go view the holy fire for themselves, considering the time of the year? Oh no, no. I mean, we're we're gonna go. Yeah. Yes, we're gonna go see uh, the holy sepulchre. But our chances our chances of seeing uh, of seeing the holy fire are are probably nil, because nobody is allowed in there, other than the patriarch and I believe uh, some of his uh, some of his priests. So. The Patriarch of Jerusalem, in fact. Uh, Jack Sage has a question. What is the theological purpose of communion in orthodoxy? Um, well, theologically, it is a it is a command. It is a command from God. Um, and uh, so I'm look at this. I'm I'm right. Uh, I'm right here. Um and he's still going to do show and tell. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I just, you, you, I just, uh, I can't help it. I'm, that's, that's uh, unfortunately who I am here. Um, 
the theological purpose of communion and orthodoxy? I feel like I'm back in college with that question. <laughs> Um, could could you apply uh, one of the um, uh, a view of what is practical and what is symbol uh, and what is uh, symbolic when you discuss communion? Sure. So, um, so John chapter five. Okay, he's just finished. Uh, he's just finished the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, and now he's having a discussion with the people. Uh, and he's talking about, I am the bread of life. And they're saying, give us this bread. And then he says this, and he's making the comparison between the manna that came from heaven in the Old Testament to feed the Jews and saying now that he is the one that gave that manna. And that if you eat that manna, you will still die and those people die. But I, excuse me, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And that this is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And the Jews began to argue and grumble among themselves. How can this man give us flesh to eat? And Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of man, of the son of man, and you drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Okay? So, I mean, for the Orthodox, you can't get clearer than that. Okay? And later in his um, Last Supper discourse, he will say, do this in remembrance of me. Now, the Protestants take half of that. They do it as a remembrance act, but then they ignore what happens in John chapter 5, which is the very words, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood, you have no life in you. I mean, for Orthodox, you can't get much clearer than those words. So the theologically for us, it's important because these are words of Jesus Christ, and how are we to play with those words, okay? He didn't say, it's like my, it's, if you symbolically uh, say that it is, uh, that, that, that the wine that you drink is my blood, or he didn't say any of that. He just made a, a statement and repeated it in the, um, uh, in the uh, Last Supper discourse, all right? So for us as Orthodox, that is a very clear theological, literal interpretation of what Jesus wants us to do. Now, we will not go further to explain how this happens through the drinking of the wine and the consuming of the bread. But we know what Jesus Christ has told us, that if you do this, you will remain in me. So the theological importance, number one, is that these are the very words of Jesus Christ and that we interpret them literally. Secondly, from a theological standpoint, because he says, I will raise them up on the last day, we believe that Holy Communion is essential for salvation. What is the reasoning uh, that the Protestants use to ignore that second part? Um, because they interpret, so they, um, and, and again, I'm going by, I'm, I'm going by uh, one of the more famous comment, Protestant commentators on this passage is Rudolf Bultmann. And Rudolf Bultmann sees this, and which is, which is mainline Protestant uh, theology, is that this is not meant to be a Eucharistic passage. So what, so what this is, is this is symbolic, meaning that you need to believe in me. So this is a symbolic passage where, where the bread and the blood is talking about the idea of remaining in him. And he's expressing symbolically the idea of remaining in the body of Christ. But this is not to be confused with a Eucharistic statement or a Eucharistic analogy. Uh, David Neck has a tragic story for us today. Um, he says, today I, want, I wanted to tear up. On the way to work, 
I felt so guilty. I hit a squirrel. And he ran out in front of my car, and I felt guilty all day because the squirrel passed. Oh, well, you know, I, I ha- I, I'm sorry, but I have to start this off. Uh, and Demos, I think that you also are a, a Seinfeld fan. Yes. Okay. And do you remember the episode where... I'm uh, not a connoisseur where... of Seinfeld. I, 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 ha- I like it when it's on, but I'm not a connoisseur. <laughs> oh, so there was one of the episodes where uh, George Costanza was driving the car and he hit the squirrel and he said, hey, squirrel, we had a deal. We had a deal, you know, about that the squirrel wasn't supposed to uh, run in front of the cars, <laughs> you know. And so there's a whole there, there's a whole episode, not an episode, but there's a whole scene in Seinfeld that speaks just to this point of hitting the squirrel. So if you look that up on YouTube, it's it's pretty it's pretty hilarious. Um, we look. I, I I love that. Any life that is taken, or sorry, any life is life given by God and life that he has created. And any time that life is artificially taken, meaning that it's cut short, then that is time for sorrow. Okay. I mean, you know, I, I mean, and, and Terry has been really influential on this. But, um, you know, Terry makes every single effort that she can to make sure that if there's an insect in the house that I spider or a millipede or ant, that I put it into a container and I take it outside, that I don't just step on it. Because every life to orthodoxy is sacred. Okay. Now, this I'm sure that this didn't happen maliciously. Okay. But accidents happen. And we should feel sorrow for a life that God created that was taken. Okay, so uh, now now again, we should feel sad. We should feel repentant for what it is that we did. And if we feel so moved, we should confess that. All right, but there's nothing wrong in feeling bad for having taken a life, whether that life is an ant or whether that life is a person. Is there a special prayer you should do if, in case you kill an animal while you're driving? I that's a good question. I don't know if there's a specific is it there's a specific prayer, um, but remember we um, we do um, we do as we we as as Orthodox and and again there's an ongoing debate here, but we do believe that God has given animals a soul. Okay, because He uses the word nefesh. Uh, in one of the Psalms, uh, Psalm, Psalm, oh, it's a Psalm that we read at, uh, at, at the beginning of Vespers, and I'm blanking on it right now. Um, not 142, um, uh, it'll, it'll come to me. So in that sense, why should we not then say a small prayer for the soul of that animal? And certainly we would believe for those of us that have pets, we understand and we can clearly see that there is a personality that is evident in that. So there's got to be a soul behind those eyes. Uh, then I must I must make a confession. I do not feel any sorrow when I kill a mosquito. I, I'm a terrible, uh, terrible human being. <laughs> I mean, hey, we can extend this to corona, right? Does the coronavirus have a right to live? <laughs> it is a creation of God. Oh, what, what if it's a creation of man? Huh? What if what if it is something that a man created in a lab or something? I mean, I'm not I'm not I'm not introducing this that uh, for for debate. But what if it is something that is created or uh, manufactured by man? I know uh, man does not yet have the capability to manufacture life. How what he can do is he can alter life, but he can't create it yet. All right. Uh, Brett asks, and I just lost the question. Oh, there it is. If our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then why don't we decorate our bodies with icon tattoos as we do at the church? Well, I guess I've got to go back to the argument of that, that the body belongs to God. Okay. And uh, and God in the person of the of the Holy Spirit. So the what is the reasoning for decorating the decorating the body? 
does it serve the purpose of icons, right? What is the what is the purpose of icons? The purpose of icons is to educate and and for us to consider the prototype that's being represented so that we can think on that. I think that I would not I my I would be clouded if I saw the icon of the Theotokos on somebody's chest, if they lifted up their shirt. And I just don't think that I'm going to think of the prototype, the Theotokos, in the same manner looking at somebody's chest as I would then uh, seeing the icon as displayed in church. Well, there's also another way of viewing it. Uh, man sins. And so it's not the, 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 the building of the church that's out there sinning. It's, it's man himself. So you get a tattoo of something, and not only are you sinning, but you're also, you're also performing human acts. With that mm. icon on you, I, I oh, that's yeah, that's a great point. I didn't think about that because, right, with that icon now, you're performing then, you know, whatever consider whatever is is then that sinful act. That's yeah, that's a good point. Andrew nine uh, ninety two h two h t asks, uh, can you sum up the Orthodox view on atonement? How is it different than the Western view? Well, it's summed up pretty easily by saying we don't have the theology of atonement. <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of the summation. Um, the rem and and remember and uh, there's uh, uh, you know what we're gonna last week uh, was it was it last week um, that uh, remember this question came up and and uh, and they said give a short explanation and then I gave this really long one and then Terry said I'm thank God that uh, they didn't ask you for a long one so we're gonna have to find that chop that out and then we're gonna have to have that available for a uh, for a 101 <laughs> um, but we do not as Orthodox believe, that Christ's work was sacrificial as a replacement or atonement uh, offering, meaning that God, the Father, because he cannot stand to be uh, in near sin, needs a offering that is pure, like the pure lamb, okay? And Jesus Christ, who is sinless, is that lamb, and now is offered in propitiation for our sins. Because a sacrifice must be offered to appease God. And Jesus Christ becomes that, and now our path is cleared to heaven. All right? That's atonement. I mean, again, it's not complete. I'm not, there's, there's more nuances to it than that. But that is atonement theology. Orthodoxy does not in any way have atonement theology. At what we believe is that is that God wants to reestablish the connection with his creation that was present in Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And through sin, that connection has been broken and we have lost that relationship. And God seeks to build to rebuild that bridge so that we can be reconciled back to him. And since we are unable to do anything that can reconcile us before God, because the law didn't work, right? So God gave the, the people the law, and that did not reconcile them back to God. So God now offers, knows that he must come to us. And so God, in the form of Jesus Christ— in the person, and the person of Jesus Christ becomes his own creation, and he comes to us and offers us then the mediation way that we can return to a relationship with him. And that's not atonement. There seems to be a, um, a disagreement and or misunderstanding in the chat about Abrahamic religion specifically. Uh, uh -huh. there, I'm reading statements uh, that say that Islam is not an Abrahamic religion and that a Christianity is the only Abrahamic religion. Um, I don't know if this if if this is a belief, I don't know where Judaism belongs. Um, 
in that perspective. Um, have you heard this uh, point of view before, Father? Oh yeah, I've you know I've heard that you know again um, 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 there 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 is this there is this desire to somehow separate um, uh, separate Muslims from now the one true God. Okay, and this is uh, this is not orthodoxy. Um, so you know God is very clear. I and in fact in our Sunday school videos we've even mentioned this. Okay, that that what that God's covenant with Abraham was, I will make you a father of many nations. And through Isaac, we now have the Jewish faith. And through Ishmael, we have the, we have the, um, the, the, the Muslims and we have the Gentiles. So, he didn't say, I'm going to make you the father of the Jewish nation. He said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And through both sons of both Hagar and of Sarah, we now have Judaism from which Christianity is born. And then we have the Muslims and we have the, uh, the Gentiles who are going to be now the pagans, which would be the Greeks, the Romans and all that, which St. Paul then... Because St. Paul says, you are also of then Abraham. So I don't know how you can how you can play around with God's words in that sense. A uh, quick shout outs to Disciple uh, Mike. And we have a question from Donis Yorgu. Are there any talks of bringing the Russian and Ukrainian churches together? Oh, there's always talks. <laughs> I mean, there's always conversation going on. But right now, I think we're in a we're in a very difficult uh, way. Um, there was um, uh, there was the the uh, the excommunication uh, of uh, by Patriarch Kirill of the um, of Patriarch uh, of uh, Bartholomew uh, because of the granting of the autocephaly of the Ukraine, and that was even before the war. And now, with um, the seeming sanction by Kirill of the Russian invasion, I think that this causes even a deeper divide now between the two patriarchates. So I, in the near-term future, I don't see any reconciliation. But that doesn't mean that the doors are, are closed. It just means that I think that that the situation has uh, deteriorated to a point that you know we're uh, it's going to take a while before we can heal this uh, this uh, this wound. We have a question from Hus Puppy, and it I think that this is a little bit of a uh, of a of a challenging question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, who is God? Is Christ God or man? Well. Let's 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 start easy. Man, man is man is not God, um, because certainly uh, certainly man cannot even explain how everything was created. So man is not God. All right. Um, who is God? Well, he is. The, what he uh, is. I am what I am. Uh, well, you know, uh, actually, you know, you've you've hit it right on the head, uh, because when Moses asked him, this is what he said, I am that I am. And so for us to define God, we have to go back to the words of the of the fathers. And I can start with um, I can start with the um, um, uh, St. John Chrysostom, who says that you are beyond, beyond all comprehension, uncircumscribable, uncomprehensible, and simple. So um, those are the only words that we can really use to define God. So remember, the, 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 um, the Orthodox Church is much more cataphatic than they are apophatic, meaning that we know more about what God is not then we know what God is. We have quite a few comments about um, 
about the lights. Sorry, sorry, the um the holy fire, the holy fire. And, the, and the burnt columns in particular. Oh, okay. And it seems that it has to do with a conflict between the Armenians and the Greeks. Um I like the conversation everybody's having. We're gonna revisit this next week. Um because it's an interesting topic, I believe. Um, so it's, since we're kind of out of time, I'm just going to jump ahead and ask a, a couple of questions from those who haven't had the opportunity yet. Um, Joe Jones asks, would it be a sin to have a pet with a terminal, possibly painful disease, put to sleep? Would this be a type of euthanasia? Well, then Terry and I are guilty of it on several occasions. <laughs> um, no, we we see absolutely nothing wrong in causing an animal undue suffering. And, 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 and I'm being truthful here. Terry and I have been, unfortunately, in that situation a number of times we ha where we have watched a pet that we have loved for many, many years uh, go through a very, very painful uh, suffering, um, at, you know, at the end, um, it, it wasn't necessarily the end of their normal life, but, uh, the life that they were living was clearly a life of suffering and with not having an understanding of what it is that they're going through and knowing who those animals were to us. Um, we thought we, um, that we had decided that the proper thing to do was to not let them suffer anymore. So no, um, uh, we don't, uh, we don't view that in, in any way as a, as a sin, if it's being done for that reason. Um, we certainly, certainly would be absolutely against, I don't want this pet anymore because I don't want to take care of it. Ergo, I'm putting it to sleep. Now that is absolutely uh, con condemnable by the church. But to place an animal that is clearly pain in pain and suffering, and that you want to you want it to end its suffering in a uh, in a merciful manner, then we see absolutely nothing wrong in that. Jack has an excellent question. If uh, a follow up to the earlier question about communion, if communion is required for salvation, why deny it to non Orthodox who are nevertheless seeking it? Well, the answer to that question is that orthodoxy says that it is essential for salvation for you as a proclaimed orthodox. Okay? The orthodoxy will never say that Protestants are going to hell because they are not receiving communion, because their faith, their Christian expression does not demand it from them. But if you are a professing or confessing Orthodox Christian, then you must adhere to our theology, which sees that the proper interpretation of Holy Communion is that it's essential for salvation. So in that sense, you know, we disagree with the Protestant faith that they are interpreting Scripture incorrectly. But we do not believe that their failure, according to their a theology of not receiving communion is barring their entry into heaven. We have uh, two final questions. Um, the first one is from uh, Costa V. What are the main differences of the of the two between the two different liturgies, Saint John and Saint Basil? Essentially, from the ladies' perspective, they are identical. All right. You're going to hear a slight difference when I get to uh, the part where I say um, and take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take eat. This is this is the uh, this is the blood which has been shed. What you're going to hear in the St. Basil liturgy is you're going to hear what I say silently in the St. John Christum liturgy. So in St. Basil's liturgy, you will hear me say and he. And he gave it to he gave it to his holy disciples and apostles, saying, "Take, eat. This is my body." So I have that beginning part that I say out loud in Saint Basil. All right. Also, there is a slight difference in the words of consecration 
between St. Basil and St. John. All right. So there's some slight verbiage differences there. Other than that, the liturgies from a lady perspective are pretty much the same. Okay. Where it's different is that the prayers that are said silently by the priest in the St. Basil liturgy are much, much more extended than they are in the St. John Chrysostom liturgy. So if a St. Basil's liturgy is, is being done proper, then you're probably going to hear a lot of silence or a lot more chanting in the St. Basil liturgy because there are... It, there are at times two to three pages of silent prayers that needs to be said in the St. Basil liturgy, which St. John Chrysostom has removed from his liturgy. All right. And the final question for the evening is from Django Fat. I love that name. How, cool. Should, cool. how should Orthodox Christians evangelize the faith? And do you see Orthodoxy making growth here in the United States where Protestants and Catholics dominate? You know, that I'm going to answer the second part, uh, the, the, the second part first. Um, you know, the Orthodox faith makes quite a few demands on the person that are not present necessarily in Catholic and certainly not in, uh, in the Protestant faith. Uh, as one person mentioned earlier, communion. Um, we have the difficulty of that communion is restricted to the Orthodox. So in a Protestant setting, if you believe in Jesus Christ, come and receive. But they never claim, I mean, in Anglican and Episcopal churches, yes, there is there is a claim that, that it is the body and blood. But in the vast majority of, of Protestant and non-denominational churches, um, it is a remembrance act. Uh, with it's a symbolic act, but not a literal act. So in that sense, come and receive. So everybody is open. There are much more relaxed practices in terms of what people can wear uh, when they come. Um, there, the services uh, uh, allow a much freer expression of each parish. Uh, one church can have guitars. Another church can uh, uh, can actually do enact plays. Um, the other church, uh, another church can have only sermons without necessarily a worship portion. Um, some, uh, some another only church have can, organs. So, some yes, yeah, some only have <laughs> some of them have organs exactly. Um, so so unfortunate, and I kind of make a joke here, but you know. Um, you come to an Orthodox church and the first thing we tell you is what you can't do. You, uh, you can't show up in jeans and a t-shirt. You can't show up in flip-flops. You can't uh, receive communion. Uh, you're not allowed to play your guitar. You're not allowed to sing. You know, if you're sitting in, uh, in, um, in, in the, in the pew, you know, not that you can't, but you know, we'll, we'll look at you funny if you do. Why aren't you sitting and standing at the appropriate times? You know, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to enter into. All right. So for that reason, it makes it, it makes it uh, a growth here in America difficult because you have other options that are much, much easier than orthodoxy. So now to get to the second part, how do you evangelize? Mm -hmm. You evangelize by by explaining to people why these things are in place, okay? Because that's what people are going to ask. Why can't I receive communion? Why can't I show up in my jeans and T-shirt? Why can't I show up barefoot? Why are you not preaching political messages from the, uh, from the pulpit? How come the sermon is only seven or eight minutes long? That's where we evangelize. We have to show people that we are are a Christian faith, but the reason that we seem to be so restrictive is because of X, Y, Z, so on and so forth. We have a last minute super chat that I have to get to from Tommy Williams. Thank you very much, Tommy. Hey, Tommy. All right. And it's a very good one. Uh, does orthodoxy lack in catechism for children compared to, say, the Roman Catholic Church as it's 
not encouraged as much as it should be. And I'm, I'm, before I even answer, I will ask you a question, Father. It, wouldn't Sunday school for children uh, serve as a, as a foundational introduction before catechism? Of course, 100 percent. Right, right. So do, would you say that we lack in catechism for children? So we do not lack. OK, so uh, and I got to be careful how I answer this. We do not lack in having catechism for children. We have it. We have here in our parish, we have absolutely great teachers. They're very willing. They're very excited. They are committed to teaching our youth. The problem that we have is we don't have the youth who are coming. <laughs> okay. So it's not that we don't have catechism. The problem is, is that um, unfortunately other things like sports, you know, and work have now taken over. And so, you can't, you, you can't have, you can't, all the catechism in the world is not going to help you if you don't have the people, the kids in the seats listening to the catechism. All right. So, you know, so parents, unfortunately, have made the decision, not all parents, obviously, all right, but parents have made the decision that on Sunday, sports or the child working or having the day off is more important than going to church and having a catechetical, catechetical education, okay? Now, in the Catholic Church, because they have separated those sacraments out, the parents want to see their child confirmed. They want that. And the Catholic Church has said, unless they go through the catechetical program, we're not confirming them. So the parents make the decision, and they say, all right, this is what I want. You're going to, you're going to, to, uh, to catechetical school. We, as Orthodox, give everything away when they're an infant. We, we, uh, we baptize them, we chrismate them, you know, with their conf uh, quote-unquote confirmation, and then we offer them Holy Communion. Okay, so now there's no quote-unquote carrot being held out for the parents now to say that this is what they need. Now, I'm not saying the carrot is the right thing to do, but, you know, um, we... You know, we have allowed the Orthodox have allowed a situation that the best catechisms are not are are not helping us because kids are not coming to church. I wonder if there's another carrot also involved here, because now I think about it. OK, so if you look at uh, chrismation or if you look at Judaism and their bar mitzvahs, etc., not only does it <laughs> indicate uh, a certain point in a young person's life. Um, but there's also uh, a social attachment in that. There's a, there's a, there's a party. There's, there's something very, very specific that a young person can look forward to, perhaps wrongfully, but outside of. Well, that's okay. Yeah. 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 And I, 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 I like that idea The you know, the sense of community of reading the Torah for the first time yeah. as in public. Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, would you say that maybe if we, um, if Orthodoxy were to adapt, that kind of um, momentous occasion in the in the teachings and preparation for young children, would it be more effective? I think so. I you know I mean uh, you know let's uh, let's not be too let's not be too pious with ourselves you know and use the same ancient argument of they just need to come to church because it's the right thing to do. Okay. You know, I agree with that. And and that in a theoretical world is exactly the way that it should be. All right. But we're going to need some other pull. And there's nothing wrong in my mind of bringing them because of they want to see their friends and a sense of community. And in and during that time, they receive catechetical education. What's wrong with that? I mean, you know. And that's a and that's a key word. And speaking of community, a quick shout out to some people that may have asked questions, but we didn't get to. Uh, Santa Man One always enjoy their their humor, uh, the howls, and if is that I'm... Thurston or <laughs> or people? <laughs> and oh. if I didn't if I didn't get a shout out for you, all I can say is uh, Christos Anesti. Uh, sorry for the shorter show, but under the circumstances, see even COVID won't stop won't stop us from doing 
uh, or Thursday night show. <laughs> nope. Only Holy Week stops us. Well, I mean that takes precedent. <laughs> yeah, but it is something that stopped uh, that stopped our Thursday show. So, <laughs> well, that's it for us tonight. We will return next week in studio. And all right. Once again, thank you all for your questions. If we didn't get to one of your questions, please submit it next week. We try to get to as many as possible. I'll make sure to share, uh, like this video, and just let people know that we're here and mm -hmm. that we accept as many questions as we can get. <laughs> yes. Again, thanks, everybody, for being patient uh, today with our, uh, with our remote discussion. Uh, as always, I've really enjoyed the, I've really enjoyed the questions. And uh, I certainly look forward to uh, seeing you all next week, certainly on Sunday and also next week. All right. With that said, have a great night, everyone, and we'll see you real soon. See you soon. Peace out, Nasty.